And hello everyone, welcome to today's PNET Community Stand-Up. I'm excited today we're joined by Chris Heilman and Syed Hashimi and we're gonna be looking at new web tools for Visual Studio. So welcome folks. Hello. And uh, as always, we start with some community links. So I will jump right to those so that we can quickly get to the fun with the web tools. Um, as always, the links are shared in the show notes. Afterwards, I'm putting them in the chat so you can see them live. And I also throw them up on a banner. So they're all over the place. OK, let's get in. Uh, first of all, we've got the, um, the 25th anniversary of Visual Studio. So we've got an event coming up on the 17th. So a short blog post on that by, by Mads Christensen. So that is pretty cool, 25 years. Um, Next, we've got uh, we've got one here on automating builds with Nuke. Um, so uh, Laurent is uh, writing about how they uh, have tried some different build solutions. They previously had Cake, which is you know a great solid uh, community provided uh, build solution, and uh, but they they wanted something more declarative, and so they talk about how they're uh, this is something that they've done in their development shop. So they um, they talk about, or he talks about how they migrated from Cake to Nuke. Um, and there's actually a command. You can do Nuke uh, Cake Convert. Uh, and then there's a, a extension for that as well. So you can go through and debug your build. And uh, then also a pretty cool thing is there's some visualization. Um, so after he, sh he shows this uh, code that's generated for his build, and then you can actually uh, view the build process afterwards. So where is that? Uh, right here. So you can actually see the build execution plan. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, okay, um, this is a neat one from NOP Commerce. Uh, NOP is a, um, a great solution for commerce for ASP.NET. And it's been around for a while. Um, it's, it's a, you know, we've featured them several times in the past. It's exciting to see here, they've migrated from .NET 5 to .NET 6 and they're sharing their performance improvements. Um, so they talk about, you know, why the migration and, and the um, LTS support in .NET 6. 
Um, and then they show some of the, um, the performance benefits. So comparing the different um, build versions, and here you can see some pretty massive improvements. Um, you know, I mean, .NET Core 3.1 and .NET 5 are already pretty fast, but this is, this is huge. So this is showing a response time going from nearly three seconds to, to right around one second. Um, and then some other things too, uh, some, some changes in memory usage and uh, load distribution. It's interesting here that the, the um, profile here is actually they're seeing higher memory usage. Um, and, you know, so sometimes there's a trade off in memory versus performance. And of course, you can tune that. Um, but uh, so overall, you know, some, some huge performance improvements mostly in, uh, in response time. So that's pretty cool. Uh, this is a neat post from Ken on the uh, .NET blog. <laughs> so he's writing about sharing code between ASP.NET on .NET Framework with .NET Core. And when I saw this post pop up, I immediately was reminded of this. This is a blog post I wrote in 2010 about the MVC2 version of MVC Music Store. So this was right when MVC was pretty new. And we created this as a sample application just to learn ASP.NET. MVC. And uh, so we, you know, we regularly talk to customers that are, you know, have existing solutions built on .NET Framework with ASP.NET Core. Uh, we recently in January did a whole event on migrating your applications from .NET Framework to .NET Core. But in some cases, you do need to share code between them. Uh, you need to continue maintaining, running an, an existing app and running an ASP.NET Core app and sharing that, that controller code. So here, uh, Ken shows real life examples of doing that. And so he's showing, you know, including it and then using some, some pragma, you know, some if, if defs and, and basically deciding when to share. And, and there's relatively minor changes between uh, ASP.NET Core and ASP.NET uh, on framework. Um, and then also as well sharing views, and you can also continue to, you know, comment things in and out. So there's a variety of solutions available. Obviously, it's a lot simpler if you're able to do a, a full migration. Um, but if you do need to share code between, uh, it is possible to do that. All right. Um, this one just popped up. I was excited to see this uh, WebKit. Uh, so Safari uh, 15.4 dropping and releasing several things. Lazy loading of uh, images is, is one thing I've been looking for. There's also the has property uh, or pseudo class in CSS. So a lot of things that, you know, that, that we we're kind of waiting on for full cross-browser support. And so nice to see those, those shipping. All right. And then I just have two, uh, two remaining blog posts. This is one on the... Uh, the announcement blog post that Chris and Syed wrote uh, just announcing this feature we're going to be talking about today, and then a link to the uh, to the actual download for the extension. So those are those are in the links I've shared. I'm ready to turn it over to you folks. All right, who's up first? Syed? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Why not, dude? Um, so yeah, so basically what we've done is uh, we've worked with uh, with Chris and his team at the Edge Developer Tools and and basically kind of integrated the Edge Developer Tools into Visual Studio 2022. And uh, this does require 17.2 uh, there. So, you know, for the, for the viewers out there, if you wanna uh, try this at home, you'll need to get 17.2 and then that extension there. Um, so yeah, and then, um, you know, this does work for, for both ASP.NET Core as well as ASP.NET Full Framework. Um, it's currently has a limitation that it doesn't work for .razor files. Um, so if you're working with a, you know, a Blazor uh, project there, this, this won't work for those, for those types of files yet. But, you know, that's on our kind of radar there. Um, yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and kind of kick it off here. So... Uh, first, I'll show you what the um, ASP.NET Core uh, web app that I have here. So, you know, I've got my index.cshtml file loaded up here. Uh, one thing you might notice here is we've got a new kind of preview button here. So let's go ahead and click on that. So this is going to go ahead and uh, create um, 
This is actually kind of a the the web view two control from from Microsoft Edge here. So we can see my my application is um, you know this is like a preview of the application essentially, right? Um, and then over here we can click to open uh, the Edge Developer Tools. Let's go ahead and try that. All right, so now we've got the kind of embedded Edge Developer Tools over here, and all the things that you're used to doing with the uh, with these particular tools and edge developer tools, you know, those should work in Visual Studio. Um, we don't have the, we don't have all of the kind of tools supported here, but what we do have is elements, network, and network conditions, issues, and this network request blocking one. Uh, and, you know, these are the main ones that, that most people, you know, I think elements tab is, is going to be the most kind of interesting uh, aspect of this. All right, let's go ahead and kind of take a take a look here. So uh, we can then go ahead and kind of start inspecting things over here, basically, just like you would in if you were kind of uh, modifying your app itself. Uh, but before that, let me show you. Let me pin this. So one thing, another thing that uh, that is kind of interesting is if you click on the link, uh, it'll actually open up the file itself. So let's go ahead and oh. kind of open that file up there and keep an eye on that one. All right, so let's go here and, you know, first let's take a look at this kind of overview here. We've got this kind of um, this tool tip here, which will kind of tell, let me actually move it to where we can see it better here. So here there's a, there's a lot of kind of great information here and, you know, people, they might not actually look at this tool tip a whole lot, but um, you can do a lot of, there's a lot of good information here. You know, my kind of favorite thing here is the, the contrast here. So we can see... Um, the first thing under the accessibility heading here is contrast. So I can immediately see if I've got a good contrast here. And, and here on this one, we can see I do have a good contrast of 4.61. And I, I thought I had an example of a kind of low contrast one, but uh, but maybe not. But anyways, all right, let's go ahead and start uh, kind of changing some stuff up over here, basically. So let's say if I want to give this a different... Um, Let's play around with color here, basically. So let's try color here. So we can see as I, as I kind of loop through these colors and edge developer tools, you can see that the, the the preview is getting kind of uh, updated automatically there. So let's go ahead and go with chocolate here. All right. So now let me go back to to my CSS. Take a look for chocolate uh, here, and we can see now I've got that kind of chocolate declaration there. So. So we can see on line 29, I've got chocolate there. All right, another kind of cool thing here is um, with Edge Developer Tools, uh, if you're playing around with your CSS, you can check and uncheck these. So if I was to uncheck this, uh, and we do have a bug where the, the CSS will scroll back to the top, so apologize about that. But we can see now that that color declaration has been commented out. If I was to recheck that and go back, we can see it's, it's there. Uh, oops. Let's go back to where we were. One second. Sorry about that. Let me get back to... Oh, hold on. Let's go back home. Let's try this one more time. Okay. All right. Okay, so we got that. Let's take That's a look super, at... What I'm realizing watching this, I mean, these are things I just naturally am doing in a separate browser side by side right and so this kind of integrates it together and also all these manual steps normally i would go and tweak in my browser tools until it looks right and then i would go update my code so this is just yeah that, that is the uh, that that was the main uh, idea behind that i mean we call yeah. it the better together story inside edge we started with visual studio code where we integrated the browser into the environment and we wrote an extension for that one and now we wanted to bring it to vs as well i think in vs users are more used to have like a preview in the editor itself than in vs code and vs code people jump between the browser and the editor all the time but for uh, developer efficiency it really is not useful because we're actually as you said you go to the browser you tweak things around and what then mm -hmm. Basically, all the changes are lost as soon as you reload the page and you have to remember what you change. There's a changes tab that hardly anybody uses. 
but mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we don't know where we change things. And with this integration, you get the browser, the developer tools, and your code next to each other. So you don't have to jump between the context of the browser and the, and the editor anymore in the background. And a really cool thing is as well that you have a dedicated browser instance here. So you, none of your um, extensions, none of your settings of the browser interfere with what you have there. Like uh, when you want to test your app out and you would have an autocomplete with all the stuff that you entered in form fields the last six weeks, that's normally not, not helpful. Or often we, we get bug reports for the browser that, are relied, that rely on extensions running in the background, that people have like third-party extensions that interfere with the DOM, and then the browser dev tool shows something different. And we have no idea what's going, for, what's going on there. So by having a dedicated browser instance in your developer environment, or in your editor right now, you have a pristine new environment to work with, which is really, really cool because as soon as you close it, it's away, it's gone away as well. And another thing is performance because this thing is basically dedicated to your app performance right now. Whereas if you have like me, I think I've got 87 tabs open. <laughs> like, of course, all my yeah. apps seem to be slow, which is which I do deliberately. So I write faster code. But uh, in this case, it's a really good thing to get like a real uh, uh, idea of what, how your apps would perform without actually all your other tabs and all your other browser windows interfering with the issue here. Okay. I did see a button too in there because it's nice to have it integrated. If you do need to pop it out for, you know, side by side or whatever, I did see there was a button that said like open in browser on there too, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then yeah. if I do that, does that keep yeah. still a dedicated, it's like you're saying the dedicated instance kind of? I um, think it should. It might actually be broken right now. Yeah. Look yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, this is uh this is some kind of <laughs> some kind of bug over but here, the, dude. But the thing is also that as uh -huh. you have a, a, an address here, you have like localhost eighty eighty whatever, you cannot go to any browser oh, window right. and put the same URL in there and that one would, mm -hmm. would open it in that instance of the browser then. So if you have an extension that you rely on, you can okay. actually have that in your own window as well. Got it. And okay. also test it in other browsers if you want to at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think it would work. Um, let me it try should, to change yeah. the color again. Um, but I think we would, I, I think the, I think the changes would, yeah, the changes go to oh, the, nice. okay. the changes go over here too. Um, so yeah, so that would, that would work too. Um, so yeah, if you like to do kind of a, uh, if, if you want to have a separate kind of browser, you can do that as well. And, and then the changes will be pushed to all the kind of connected instances here. So that's the idea there. Um, but you could also, you know, users could also rip out this window as well, right? This is a normal kind of Visual Studio tool window. Um, so if you want to take this out and put it on a different screen, uh, the same for the Edge Developer Tools window here, you can take this out and put it on a different screen as well or, or lay it out however you like there. So you've got those options as well. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's pretty cool. All right. So let's kind of keep going here. So, uh, one thing that I'm noticing here is we've got this kind of flex, uh, declaration here. So for users that are not aware, there's some kind of built in, uh, flex tools inside of edge developer tools here. So we can, uh, we can see what would happen, uh, on the various different settings here, uh, with flex and similar, similar kind of tooling here for. Uh, for CSS Grid as well. And, uh, you know, this is pretty handy for, for people who are not like CSS experts, you know, like myself here. So uh, oftentimes I find myself just playing around in Edit Developer Tools just to kind of get it to looking how I want and and then kind of go from there, you know? Oh. So, yeah. We so there's a that. few questions in the chat that people ask where to get that extension. We're going to give you a URL oh. later on to actually yeah. to actually look at or the blog post that John talked about. There's a direct link there as well. And that yeah. is actually WebView 2 that's running in here. Yaniscu7 asked that one. So it is basically the Chromium-based edge that's going on there. So the good thing is if you want to test for Chromium or Chrome, and Chrome and Edge are the same browser nowadays under the hood. We're just validating on the uh, on the different uh, uh, UX on top of it, so you don't need to test across these two browsers any longer. It's just the same engine, so the the it, you have predictable rendering across the two of them there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, there 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 is an AKA link, so I think it's aka.ms. I just pasted that in the Edge Tools uh, for VS. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, great. 
All right, perfect. Okay, so yeah, let's let's kind of keep going here. So, uh, so we've got those flex tools, and let me let me show you the kind of corresponding uh, grid uh, tools over here. So this is an uh, I think this is a Razor, I think this is a full framework Razor Pages uh, application here. Uh, yeah, this is full framework Razor Pages. So over here. Um, instead of just a preview, we, we have like a design and split over here. So that this would offer a little bit more kind of functionality, but that's a, that's kind of a, a part of web live preview and kind of orthogonal to the kind of edge developer tools here. Um, so yeah, let me go ahead and open up the edge developer tools for this one. Let me get something. Where's my, sorry, I was just, just looking for something here. I had a. I had some kind of file open here, but now I can't find it. Where is that thing? Okay. All right, great. So yeah, let's let's take a look at this kind of grid. Uh, we'll make this into a grid with CSS grid, I guess, real quick. Uh, first thing I want to do is kind of take care of my my header here. So if I want to introduce a new um, style here what i want to do is you, you got a couple options here in the edge developer tools right so if i just create a new style at the very top uh, you'll notice that the link says inspector style sheet so this is something that's you know temporary for the browser itself um, so if i wanted to develop it you know and go into my files i'm gonna you see how i've got gridcard.css so down here i will click the plus button now it's created a new h1 in gridcard.css uh, yeah, and then it kind of moved it for a second, so so we can go ahead and align that. So now we can see my title has been centered there. Let me go ahead and click some. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong button there. Okay, so now let's take a look at this grid card section. So I'll do a similar thing here, and then it and then it moved it again. Uh, okay, all right. So let's do display grid, and then let's do a grid you, template you, call. You see immediately that the icon appeared next to the display grid as well. So this, these features that like if we got complex things that need more than one entry point, you can actually get immediately get these settings. So you can start clicking them and generate the rest with that one. And that gives yeah. you a, a direct preview or a predictable preview of what's going on there and what all these different settings mean. So you don't even have to look them up any longer, which is really mm -hmm. useful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely do love the kind of built in uh, grid um, uh, tools there. I, right, we did so have I'm... a question come in, and this is actually something I was wondering about because an um, application I work on uses a lot of SAS. How does it work with preprocessors? Yeah. Work... Go okay, go on. Go ahead. go ahead, go ahead. We're working on the support for that. We're working on support for source maps at the moment. Uh, the the issue that we found is that it's that there is no direct correlation a lot of times between what's happening in SAS to what the, CS, what the CSS was compared with, like the source maps don't have all the information in it. So if you use like variables or nested selectors or something like that, that's fine. But mix in within mix in, we sometimes had a problem to find from the source map where the original code is from. So by changing the CSS around, we cannot always change the uh, the source code around, but we're that's one of the biggest requested things in the VS Code extension as well. So we're very much considering uh, uh, on that one. So we. We will have to deal with, uh, we will have to roll that out and then ask people to give us lots and lots of demos to see where it can fail. So we can actually find out where to get the source map uh, compilation. Because the problem with SAS is that it's not live. It's you compile and then you get some CSS and we have to find out somewhere from that compiled CSS to go back to the original code. Like if it were CSS in JS or something where the where it's on, on compile time where it changes all the time, we have mm -hmm. no problem. We actually have to find out especially when you start editing in the CSS editor and you add extra lines there, how do we tell the SAS editor that next time they have to compile that one as well? So there's a that's a classic case of like where something isn't standardized, but something is an abstraction and we yeah. don't know how to actually get it back. What we're also working on a new spec for source maps in the, uh, in the JavaScript community. So that's something that we want to work on that as well. So it's, it's coming. Okay. That's the short answer. Yeah, so that's related to a question we just had. So would that work with something like React or React Native? 
again, if the source maps are created and the code can be followed back up the pane, in, in essence, what we're doing here is we have the developer tools that we have in the browser that work with the DOM that gets generated. And we need to find out somehow or where that DOM came from and what we can do with the source code. So uh, if we got a source map to follow back up on, then probably we can do it. We have a few React demos where that actually works as well. But it's tricky because like, what do we want to support? Do you want to support, we, we support source maps at the moment. And we hope that every abstraction does it right. But do we want to do a fully sweep on React, on Vite, on uh, on like ten of the other frameworks that were created yesterday? Like yeah. it's it's a it's a real it's a real race that we have to do support for. But the source source maps will be the main tool to actually get the access between those those two. And React is another issue altogether because they have their own dev tools in the browser, anyways, because they don't generate a DOM, but they generate a virtual DOM. Which uh, we yeah. cannot even access from the developer tools. Nice. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, one other question was: um, Do you need anything? Do you need a special? Like, do you need Jet Edge installed, or do you need anything specific, specific build or whatever? You need Edge installed um, on a Windows machine that happens automatically. You have it already on my Mac. I had to install it. Uh, but you can use it on Linux, Mac, uh, uh, or Windows, and you can also do it in any version that you want to. So you can have a canary build that you would call from that extension, and you can have a stable build to use for your normal work. So this is also possible. But Edge mm -hmm. is this is Edge specific, completely. You cannot yeah. have it in Chrome. You cannot have it in Firefox. Mostly because we're not working on these codes. We 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 uh, what we do in developer tools, we actually bring back to the Chromium core, and Google can take that on for Chrome as well. But mm -hmm. Firefox is completely separate from that, and we would we, we're happy for them to take some of the functionality on, but it's a totally different beast. And I know because I worked for Firefox before I came to Windows. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, just to just to clarify for the audience there, what I'm showing here is in Visual Studio that you know only runs on Windows here. Uh, but Chris is referring to the Visual Studio Code extension that they have. So, you know, if you're on Mac or Linux there, you know, you've got the, the Visual Studio Code Edge Developer Tools extension there. And uh, we, we haven't brought this to Visual Studio for Mac yet. Uh, they're, they're currently working on getting their new kind of version up and running. Uh, but, you know, if that's something that the Visual Studio for Mac users are interested in, uh, definitely do leave some feedback here. And... Uh, th this is a preview so we can get this type of feedback, essentially, right? We're trying to figure out where we need to uh, spend our resources there. For sure. All right. Okay. Uh, those, gr cool. those grid tools are super useful. That's a, totally an example where I would be going back and forth and editing the HTML and, the, or, you know, editing the attributes in the browser tools and then syncing it back. So that's a huge, huge time saver. Yeah. Doing a hack and use search and copy and paste exactly. random code and change some numbers <laughs> around and hope it doesn't break. Yeah. Yeah. Full stack yeah. full stack overflow development. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. There there's even more kind of visualizations here. You know, I just added a grid gap. <clears throat> just added a grid gap declaration here. And if I was to hover over that, we can see the impact that that declaration has on the kind of rendered page there and the little kind of purple highlights there as well. And, and also with the kind of grid template columns here, we can see the columns and then the, um, yeah, we can see the columns that we've laid out there as well with the kind of overlay there. All right. So I, I would assume then that I'd like, because it's standard CSS at this point, but how this works with, say I've got bootstrap with a custom theme or all that, that should all just kind of, that's just standard CSS. That should all just yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay, cool. All right. Um, I was just going to finish up this kind of grid here or whatever, uh, but but we can we can talk about some other uh, features that we have. So one was the uh, the color palette here. So let me find. Let me go and add a color declaration to this guy here, and then we'll take a look at that color palette. Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so Edge Developer Tools has a pretty kind of cool color palette over here as well. So uh, we can we can modify the color here or, or switch the format as well from RGB to hex to HSLA. Uh, and then they've also, uh, the, the contrast ratio is, is shown over here as well. And then you can kind of store your, you know, if you've got some kind of color palette and 
And Chris, uh, Chris, Chris had a pretty good um, explanation of these two lines here. You want you want to explain these two lines here, Chris? Yeah, there are several accessibility standards in terms of how much contrast you need. So the upper one is the triple A, uh, is the double A, and the lower one is the triple A. So triple is basically if you if you have a government website and you have to comply with different standards, this is what at least you should go. So in between those two, you have colors that already have enough contrast. Below the 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 second one, everything has more than enough contrast. So we're just overlaying these things. There might be a new algorithm coming soon to those as well because the the current one doesn't recognize a font width or font weight. So there's something else coming in that direction, but the functionality will be the same. And I really love the idea that just by picking a color, you already get the information down there if you're gonna be if you're gonna be accessible enough or not, or if it's not gonna be readable for different people out there as well. I wrote a huge article on the, the uh, on the Edge Developer Tools docs about accessibility features in the uh, in the developer tools, and also a cross reference to like what to test with what tool. That was also part of a Skillshare video course that I made that outside of that. But the, it was a good thing we can reuse it in the official documentation. So you can, if you want to learn more, more about these features and what they mean, uh, that's actually all in the Edge Docs directly. And uh, uh, it, it's been written for like in a very simple fashion for a lot of people. And it's also translated into several languages. It's automatically translated. So sometimes it's more lyrical than useful, but uh, that's a different story of like machine learning. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing is also there's a color picker here. If you go to the next to the round swatch, there's this color picker icon. And with that one, you can get out of developer tools and actually pick a color from anywhere on the on the screen as well if you wanted to. So oh, cool. this 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 would normally if you have to have a design where you need to pick colors, you can actually get it from there yeah. as well. Seems not to work right now because yep. we're sharing yep. or something. But some this of, is something some kind of to here. consider as well. So if you have mm -hmm. a if you have a, a a color a heading heading image for example, and you want to find a color scheme that is good enough, then you can pick the color there, and then you can see the contrast ratio down there. To, how do you have to tweak it to actually make it readable? Ah. With uh, there, there's also the Windows uh, 11 Power Tools. Um, so you can you can always oh, yeah. if you've got that installed, it's, I think it's Windows Shift C, I think for the for the color picker there. So this is the Windows, yeah, Power Power Tools color picker as well. So that's that's always an option. Um, it's always an option as well on Windows. Cool. Okay, let's show the. Uh, so there there's also some specific uh, box kind of shadow support over here too. Let me show that real quick, I guess. So let's do a box shadow of, uh, what's the, I, I never use this box shadow. Five what's, picks, what's... five picks black. Got it. For example. And once you do that, you get the little box here and then you can click on the little box and do, uh, get a visual editor for your blur settings, spread settings and drop down settings as well. So you don't need to know the syntax as <laughs> science <laughs> just showed. <laughs> yeah, right. And this is, pretty, this is make it... pretty lovely what you can do with wow. that as well. And that is pretty neat, huh? Uh, another thing that I think is important to uh, <laughs> to bring up because I spend all my time doing that is that all of these tools are also keyboard accessible and are accessible to screen reader users. So people yeah. who are actually visually impaired and have like a Zoom reader or something like that, these things are utterly tested and uh, supported across different platforms for these things as well. We have to do that in Microsoft because we cannot release anything if it's not tested that way. And we put all these changes that we put in there and make sure that everybody can use it. Nobody's blocked out back into the Chromium project as well. So uh, Chrome, uh, Brave, any other browser that's based on Chromium is also benefiting from that work right now as well. It's sometimes interesting when you have discussions about like how to make a color picker available to somebody who can't see, but that's a different, <laughs> that's an interesting yeah, yeah, problem yeah, to yeah. deal with because yeah, we always yeah. see, uh, we always see a disability yeah. as a one-off, like somebody's blind or not blind, and that's not the case at all. There's so many different scales on that one and so many different, different people use a screen reader that actually are not completely <laughs> non-sighted. So it's, it's very interesting to find these use cases as well. I lost my glasses the other day, so I was two weeks running around with like three-year-old glasses mm -hmm. that are totally not right and not very focal. So I know exactly what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think I think with uh, with disabilities and whatnot, people they always think about you know permanent disabilities, but 
um, you know, sometimes I have a problem with my hand, which, which makes typing very difficult. So then I'll use, you know, dictation uh, in those kind of cases there. And, you know, and obviously accessibility is a huge thing across, you know, Microsoft as well. And, and that's, you know, honestly, one of the reasons why we're working on Web Live Preview is because the existing web forms designer is, is just not accessible and, and it's too, too difficult to make it accessible. And, and like Chris said, you know, it's not for, it's not just for permanently disabled, you know, you can, you can have a temporary disability and, and leverage those tools as well. And, and oftentimes the accessibility features are also the power user features, right? I mean, you know, you, you've got your keyboard shortcuts and, and even though you have no problems using a mouse, you might prefer to do the keyboard shortcut just because it makes you a little bit more productive there. Okay, cool. Yeah, that, um, you know, that's like you're like you're both saying, that's something that I use a lot. I'll often use read aloud features in, in Edge or, you know, like all sorts of different accessibility things. And, and that's something I, you, Chris, you, you taught me this earlier when we did that accessibility uh, event. There's a lot of it's like when we benefit accessibility, it's that whole spectrum and you benefit everyone. You give a lot more ways of interacting with the content to everyone. <clears throat> yeah, another another thing I wanted to kind of go over here was uh, the support for these, um, uh, the, the different states here. <clears throat> uh, for example, you can, you can mimic a, a hover state or an active state. Um, I, I don't have a good, um, I don't think I have a good example. Okay, there's one. So focus, focus visible, visible here. So that's one. So if you wanted to just see what your styles would look like in these different kind of states, you can always use these uh, for that as well. Yeah, that is super interesting because uh, when you do, for example, design a hover state, you always have to hover over it to see mm -hmm. it in action. And that, that way you actually, as soon as you go away back into the editor, your hover state goes away. So you're actually designing in the uh, designing blind. But if you actually turn these uh, forced settings on, then you can define use the, the design uh, designer here to define the hover state and not only the main state of the thing. So that way, if you now roll over it, you will see the difference there and you don't have to, to do, uh, you don't have to fix the changes all the time going back and forth. And the biggest problem as this, uh, especially when you're doing transitions and animations and stuff is that it's too much fun to test hover states. So you're not actually writing code. You're just playing with your app 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's a good way to actually avoid that kind of interaction and mm -hmm. making sure that you write your code and do your job. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, b besides the kind of visual aspect of this, uh, there are some additional uh, kind of features and capabilities here. So let's take a look at the network tab. Um, you know, you can not only see the, the network requests that are coming and going, uh, but there's also this kind of throttling here. So let's say if you wanted, you know, let's say if you have a, you want a website that's going to work well uh, for, you know, a slow internet connection here, you can, you can then go and kind of uh, mimic those with the edge developer tools, even even test your offline mode as well, and also disable cache and and uh, those types of features there. Why don't we, this why is don't important. We, um... This is important. So many times you will find that your application sh uh, shows random functionality problems and interaction problems on slow connections. And we all work on too fast connections that actually is not representative of our users out there. And the best thing is to get a mobile phone out in a very bad connectivity and try it out yourself. But with these network throttling opportunities, you actually can see where issues show up and also how annoying your interface might be for somebody on a slow connection. So you can actually do analysis of what shows up first. Like the, the most interactive elements of your app should always show up first to a user in the, irregardless of their connectivity and speed. And you can simulate that with these environments quite easily because you would never suffer their, uh, their pain because you would never know how badly your app performs on a bad connection. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think uh, I think I've taken up a lot of the uh, the time here. I'd like to like to give Chris an opportunity to. Well, I've been interjecting with you all the time, so it's all good. We had the same okay. time. So, <laughs> <I think. laughs> okay. Great. I mean, one, one thing we one thing we can go back to if you go to elements. What I think is really exciting as well is if you go around your application and you use the picker, and you can see in the left hand navigation the different CSS files. So sometimes you want to edit something, you get a third party application to fix, 
and you don't just know where in the 6,000 CSS files this thing comes from. And if you just use the picker and you can see on the left hand side these file names, then you actually know which CSS it came from. And when you use the picker and click on it and then click on the file name, it jumps to the right file in your uh, in your VS as well in this case. So oftentimes you don't know how to fix something because you don't know where it came from. But in this case, you go directly to the file where the problem occurred and fix it there. And that's something that depending on when you have no insight into the architecture of the app that you're supposed to debug, that's a very, very useful thing to jump around and, and be able to, to be more efficient that way. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, one thing we wanted to talk about as well as the issues panel, if you want to show the demo that you had there. Being a web developer, I know a lot of people that come from ASP.NET or other environments or still think like web development is a weird little thing, and it is. And I've been one for 25 years. And one thing I hated was that my career started by me knowing how many browsers mess up in different ways. I don't want to have that knowledge anymore. I don't need that knowledge anymore. And this is why this issues panel is great because it actually gives you information about accessibility issues in your application. It gives you information about compatibility issues across different browsers. It gives you other information, security and performance information. So by using this issues panel, you can find out what's wrong in your app and how to fix it. So you can see in the accessibility, for example, up there it explains to you that form elements must have a label. And if you expand that, it actually tells you where in your HTML that happens. And you can click on go to elements and click on that one and go directly to that element to see where the issue is. You can also see in the HTML itself that you got this squiggly line, which is a perfect term for that, uh, is under that form field that shows you that something is going wrong there. So if you just roll over that one, you get the hover information that you don't need to go through the issues panel. But the issues panel is like a great to-do list of what you need to fix in your product. And I love, for example, the compatibility one that tells you now this is not this is not supported by Firefox and Android or Safari iOS 13. So probably nobody but random testers have all these things set up or don't want to actually test it. And if you're Windows, testing for Safari is impossible. So it's great that you get this information and the compatibility issues to see what impact your your choices in your CSS and in your HTML have. Some HTML elements like output, for example, are not supported by Internet Explorer, which is, yeah, it's a dead browser, that, but it's still something when you have to maintain a, 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 an old legacy product, you might realize that it just sees it as a diff. So it doesn't, it's got to get benefits of using an output element. But again, there you get further reading links as well. So when we talked about earlier that you do research on the web from time to time, you actually find out that there is uh, that there is opportunities to just click on that and you get explanations what the issue is, how to fix it. And we want to take that further as well. Like when you when you see what we're doing in, inter, uh, in Visual Studio Code, and I don't want to share because we, we actually, I don't think it makes much sense to go through that. We do that squiggly line underline in your source code. So we give you the information directly in your source code so you don't even have to go to the issues panel. And we do a live analysis of your code as you type it. So when you type, for example, an image in there and you don't put an alternative text into it, it will give you a squiggly line under it and complain immediately and say like, by the way, this is an image, you should give some alternative text or some empty alt attribute if it's just an image that doesn't need any explanations. But if you don't do that, it reads out the file name for somebody with a screen reader, which would be super annoying, especially as we, our URLs are super long these days. So I, I love that we uh, that by integrating this issues functionality into the dev tools and subsequently also into the code, I can actually prevent it from making mistakes while I'm coding rather than just like having a test run afterwards and the tests are coming back to me and long discussions between me and the person who reported if it's really an issue or not. I can see immediately what needs to be done and what the most obvious problems are. And I'm excited if uh, if we can get further in this uh, in this integration with Visual Studio to get some automated checks and to get some automated fixes in the future as well. I mean, you got the insights from uh, from IntelliSense where you get like the little light bulbs in other code, like for refactoring. And we could use this functionality to actually offer you refactoring options in inaccessible problems or in issues with other, like for example, when you use a MOS animation and not an animation, it tells you that it's, uh, you should follow it up with an animation for all the other browsers. So 
in a in a future in in a future version of that one, we could give you like one of these light bulbs and do that change automatically for you by clicking on it. That's something that I would love to see as well, because this is like 25 years of knowledge in a system how things can break, and that one uh, that one gives you the information directly while you code rather than like afterwards. And I think that's a very exciting thing. Under the hood, this is using the Hint engine, the Web Hint engine. That's also an NPM module. So if you're actually in a JavaScript environment and you want to use that for your uh, continuous integration or your continuous uh, continuous builds, you can use that engine to run over your code or your finally generated code as well. But here you can see it live while you're editing in it. And I think this one is a huge time saver for me, not having, uh, the, not stopping a release because I forgot some accessibility thing, for example, because it tells me immediately what's going on there. Where does that information come from? Things like browser support changes over time. That is comes that from uh, MDN, uh, the Mozilla oh. Developer Network, and the uh, and the data set that is caniuse.com. That is basically an open data set for that that gets maintained across different companies and platforms like the Mozilla Open Docs or Open Docs, whatever it's called right now. And also we we share this information with all the other browser makers. So this is not a Microsoft specific thing. That's an open shared database or data set that actually everybody contributes to. Nice. Yeah. and. Uh... <laughs> You know, one thing that we were kind of thinking about was, and Chris kind of touched on this, is, you know, bringing these into uh, to the Visual Studio experience. So we're uh, kind of thinking about, you know, should we should we bring the issues and show them as messages here in the output window or error list uh, with <clears throat> maybe with a with an action to fix and, mm -hmm. and also the kind of quick fix there as well. So, yeah, that would. That would be kind of interesting. Looking, looking for feedback uh, on all these things, you know, for sure. What's the best way for people to leave feedback if they if they do have feature requests? Or yeah, great. So if they're working in Visual Studio, you can always send feedback here, report a problem, or suggest a feature. <clears throat> for report a problem, uh, this is you know if you're running into a bug, you know it's it's not behaving the way that you think it should be. Uh, and then suggest a feature is you know hey if you like a new feature to be added there you can you can do the suggest a feature uh, but you know at the end of the day if you get the wrong bucket we can always kind of we'll switch it on our side whether it's a a feedback or a suggestion there um, I'd say that's the the primary way uh, but then in addition to that they can leave comments on the the blog post there and uh, and there's always Twitter as well. You know, both uh, Chris and I are pretty active on Twitter. Um, so yeah, that's that's an avenue for feedback as well. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say between those, those are the kind of main options there. But uh, you know, if there's users that want to give us feedback in some other way, I'm I'm happy to uh, to work with them as well. Cool. Yeah, we also have a GitHub repo for the Edge Dev Tool. So if it's Edge Dev Tool specific and not the integration of the VS Code extension, we we have a brand new repo that we opened last week that actually you can file an issue on GitHub. And I just pinned an issue with Visual Studio Code uh, uh, extension there. So that's where a collecting issue, a collecting issue where where we get all the feedback if it's related to the developer parts of it and not the integration with Visual Studio Code. Uh, Visual it? Studio, oh, God damn it! I wish they had a different name for the other editor. It's really confusing. <laughs> so that's GitHub, Microsoft Edge Dev Tools. Uh, that is, hang on. That is Microsoft Edge Dev Tools. Yeah, uh, GitHub.com, Microsoft Edge Dev Tools. Well, I'm putting that in chat. Wow. Uh, Okay, I've got a question. I tried this on a larger app and it did have SAS involved. And it I got something where the in the preview it's it showed the ASP.NET error page. But then when I opened in the browser, it didn't. For those sorts of things, is there a good way to debug that if I if you hit more complex issues, or is that something where I should like just file a bug or what? What uh, what uh, say it say it one more time? What happened? Yeah, okay, so I was editing a page actually in the .NET website, and uh -huh. and um, it has a SAS build, and you know there's some complex things where I, I wasn't surprised, 
um, but it showed a it showed the ASP.NET error page, so it redirected to slash error, oh, and I wasn't okay. sure how best to debug something like that. Well, I'm not really sure. So when you when you run it, when you run it, it's working. But when you when you uh, open the preview window, it's not working. Is that what you're saying, John? Yeah, yeah. I can um, work with you separately. I just didn't know if there was a, a yeah standard. Uh, what you can probably do. Uh, is to right click and select inspect and see if there's any kind of issues here uh, okay. uh, on Perfect. the inspector. I would say that. Mm. Um, yep, that makes sense. Sounds, sounds, sounds like a timeout to me or something. Yeah. Yeah. the The other thing I would say is, you know, if your if your um, if your web if your front end requires some other kind of project to be running, like let's say your your web front your your ASP.NET Razor pages front end is going to be talking to some sort of API project. You know, you have to kind of manually fire those up uh, and get those going. So that could be potentially an issue. Uh, but yeah, maybe maybe it's project specific. But yeah, let's let's sync up to see what's happening because, you know, if you're running into something, odds are uh, other people are running into problems too. And and that's why we haven't currently built this in is because you know we do know that there there will be some issues out there and. And currently, it's a it's a V6 on the marketplace, uh, but we will be building this in over time as well. And cool. I, I saw a question about Blazor, so I did address this at the kind of top of the uh, the meeting here. But it does not currently work for Blazor, but uh, but we're working on on adding that support, and hopefully, it shouldn't be too long from now. Um, let me see. Wow. Yeah. There were also questions about JavaScript debugging. I don't know how that works in VS. In, in VS Code, you can actually do breakpoint debugging directly in the editor. I guess that's the same here, right? You can. Uh, yeah, so JavaScript debugging, we have an option over here. Uh, it's disabled by default uh, for, you know, mostly what we found is that uh, that people will actually do their JavaScript debugging in the browser as opposed to the in Visual Studio tools here, but uh, this this might be another kind of area for more collaboration uh, with the edge developer tools. Yeah. I mean, I can uh, do a quick I can do a quick show what we have in VS Code. That's something that could be like a wish list for this extension as well, and uh, just showing what how the integration works there. Sure. Famous la famous last mm -hmm. words if it works, but let's see. <laughs> um, so let me try that. Uh, let me share my Mac in this thing. Okay. While, it, while he's yeah, getting while. that set up, so the the code is actually the same. We're sharing the code for the VS Code extension in Visual Studio as well. Uh, one other thing also while getting that set up, when I started it, it said something about like, hey, you need to turn on a uh, hot reload for this. So is it, this is, oh, you're muted, Sayed. This is all in the uh, the page when you download the extension. Ah. There's a couple of options to enable there. Um, let me go to it. So one is you want to make sure that Web Forms Designer is, is, is set to Web Life Preview. And then two, um, when you go to Web Live Preview, make sure to turn these on. And my settings might look a little different, like this part might not show up, uh, but make sure that these kind of browser link and Web Live Preview things are set to true. And then that should do it. Cool. Okay. I'll switch over to Chris's stream. Yep. There we go. So this is what it looks like in VS Code. You can see already there's squiggly lines under that HTML, and it explains to me that the element must have a lang attribute. So if I type lang equals en here, yeah, the squiggly goes away, and you actually don't have the issue reported any longer. The same as if you are in your styles and you have, for example, a mouse animation here, it says also define the standard property. So if you also do an animation, dummy, one second infinite, you get the same thing that this squiggly line goes away. If you have issues, then we are actually reporting, oops, if you have issues, then we're actually reporting them in the problems pane here as well. So you get like a, a laundry list of things to fix. And that's the integration that works even without starting the, the extension, without starting the, the session, because the extension does that for you in the background for your code. 
if you want to actually start a debugging session like you do in VS Code, you, uh, in VS, you actually have to use a launch.json. That's the easiest way of doing it, where you can say, I want to go to localhost, I want to have a stable version of Edge, and I want to use the headless version. And then when you run the debug experience like you would do here, you get a session being uh, spawned up in the background. And once you see that running, you have the call stack and the watching here. And of course, while we're doing this, it takes ages. And, the yeah. and now we have that here, you actually get a session like you would do as well. So you got your developer tools here, you got your app here. You can drag that over because it's a window like any other as well. And we had that question before that, uh, what do we do about emulation? So in this environment, uh, which we haven't uh, done in the VS one yet, we have the device emulation as well. So you can actually simulate with different mobile devices and you can also rotate them and see the uh, what it would look like in this environment. And you still get the same interactivity. So it's still a full, uh, a full browser. You also have integration with the console. So when in your JavaScript, uh, you do a lot of console log messages, you actually you actually see them here as well. And you got access to the browser object. So I can go to window right now. OK, I, oh, should be lowercase for some reason. If I do window here, I get access to the window of the browser. And I can also get access to the body and do all kind of things in JavaScript that I would normally do in a console in the in the browser itself not so quickly lines so if i say body here it actually gets me the body object and then i can do style background speech puff which is a wonderful color if i set that i can change the color accordingly as well so i got the whole developer browser the developer tools browser console in that environment here as well we're also thinking about putting that up here so we actually don't have that so we don't have the emulation right now in the vs extension because we want people to try it out and play with it for now and uh, other than that the integration with the live changes and live uh, live checking if something is wrong that could be something we could light up in the other one as well, which is in VS Code at the moment. And other than that, it's the same functionality because the, the developer tools code is the same that we're using across two, two different extensions. So that's something that we're reusing accordingly. Uh, is there anything else that is really cool here? I mean, you got the live CSS changes. This is something that happens already in Visual Studio. So that's something we had to build for VS Code because we didn't do it there. But this is something you don't have to do. Also, you got this mini map here. And in the mini map, it shows you where there's issues. So you can actually see that kind of preview environments as well. So the integration in VS Code was easier because it actually is based on Chromium. And the browser dev tools are written in Chromium as well. And uh, I, I mean, let, let's, get, let's go wild. I want to show you something that actually a lot of people don't know, which is pretty, pretty exciting to me because I'm a geek. Um, so if you actually have the developer tools in the browser open and you, de you undock them, which you can do up here, one thing you can do is actually open the developer tools again and then inspect the developer tools themselves. <laughs> So this is how we actually build developer tools. We're actually we're actually analyzing, we're actually building the developer tools using the developer tools. You can even open that further and open another <laughs> developer tool on the developer tool on the developer tool, and that one works across different across a lot of things. You might actually not know, like Teams, for example, Microsoft Teams has developer tools built in as well. Visual Studio Code has developer has developer tools built in as well. So we're we are actually we're also cooking with water here. We're not like amazing uh, amazing great developers that use all kinds of strange languages. We're actually using HTML, CSS, and TypeScript to build the developer tools themselves. And uh, that the Chromium developer tools, they're open source. If you want to take part in that and you want to see how we work, that's basically something that is also always an option for you. So the main difference is, I think, the, uh, the emulation and the, uh, the, the screencast is more involved in this environment yet. We don't have that one yet yet in Visual Studio. But if that's something that you want to have and you want to see, then we can actually take a look at it as well. But right now, we want people to kick the tires off the thing that is happening right now and actually see where you're going with this. I think the debugging console is another interesting feature that might be, uh, that might be there for you. Because as people said, there's a lot of JavaScript debugging in the VS Code environment. Uh, we have full breakpoint debugging. So if you set a breakpoint 
and you do something to the app, you actually get into the breakpoint debugging here and you get all your previews directly. So that would be something we could probably integrate as well, but I'm not quite sure if uh, how it works in that environment. But the fun thing is when you're, uh, when you're a JavaScript developer like I am, you see that 90% of the use cases from people is actually not uh, using Visual Studio, uh, using the, uh, the breakpoint debugging, but most people just put a console log in there and hope that everything works out. And that's something that is kind of frustrating if you worked on the breakpoint debugging for quite a while. <laughs> but it's actually, it's interesting that, that it's user choice and all of that is for you. I mean, we are making these things not to get excited about them ourselves, although we test them in inter with internal teams a lot. It's a great thing when you have a large company, but we want your, we want to finish your, uh, we want to integrate your needs most and foremost. So that's something that I think uh, a lot of people don't realize that you actually should be, uh, that you're in control here and you, you're doing these things. So the interesting bit uh, to me as well is when we asked earlier about feedback, I get through about 400 pieces of feedback a day. And that's only the feedback that comes from one channel. That's not on, on GitHub and something. I think it's a few thousand when you actually put them all together per week. And please, if you do any feedback item, give us a way to contact you to ask more questions. Because often you get like feedback items where it's a very simple problem and I would love to help you, but I don't know how to contact you. And mm -hmm. that's one thing. And also uh, some way to, to, uh, to reproduce what the issue is. We get a lot of like screenshots of things that's broken, you're horrible, and you're something about my mother, and no information about how I can actually reproduce and find the issue and how to fix it. So that's not helpful at all. And we, uh, these channels are there again for you, and they cost a lot of time and effort. And it's great to get like real use cases because we don't know what you need. We can assume, we can do user testing, we can do surveys and stuff, but just getting day-to-day -day, uh, delivery from people and really in the wild what they've been using, that's that's just a very, very powerful thing to get. And I wish that more people would use that kind of feedback. Um, I mean, it's very easy to complain publicly that something's broken, but if you have these channels and complain directly to the people who maintain them, you have a better chance of getting them fixed than just getting a lot of people to agree with you publicly that something is broken. Just complaining that it's broken is not the most useful case of uh, cause of action, I think. For Visual Studio specifically, the, the, as Syed showed earlier, that report a problem in Visual Studio is really useful for a few reasons. Uh, one is that it gives us the exact build numbers, call stack, everything, uh, so we can reproduce the problem because something broken on your machine might not look broken on our machine. So if you can give us the information, we can reproduce it. And the other thing about that is it actually creates a, a bug in our like official bug tracking system. Um, and so that actually like, if more, if a lot of people are reporting the same issue, it'll compile that all together and it'll all, it'll show up on managers' desks when they look at their dashboards and things. So it's, it's really the best way to get things like, tweeting or, or, you know, complaining publicly, hey, I hate this, it's busted, like that doesn't help us fix the problem. So. Yeah, we have bots running as well, where basically if you file an issue in GitHub, we uh, I triage them and tag them, and then they show up in our official daily sprints as well as new bugs to fix, and they get also a preferred treatment, like not the bugs that we find that might be like esoteric, but the ones that people really, really find. And uh, it's great to see that people come up with completely different use cases that we haven't thought of. I mean, I love the amount of people that just use developer tools just to upload images because uh, some apps only allow you to use to upload images on mobile phones. So people simulate the mobile device to upload images from their, <laughs> from their browser tools. And that's a big use case. And I never thought of that. I mean, also like... <laughs> <laughs> Much like students use use translate features of browsers to get around uh, websites that their schools have blocked. I didn't say that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we were talking about great things here in developer tools, and I think the feedback mechanisms are something that I wish I would have had when I started. I think the first five years of me as a developer, browsers were black magic, and nobody had any idea what was going on there. There was no channels in. There was no code to look at. We had no insight into when the next feature is going to come. And nowadays we've got a two week, two week uh, release cycle in the browsers. And that's absolutely nuts if you think about it. It's just wonderful. And you can download the Canary versions, the dev versions, the beta versions. 
and you can try these features that are coming up soon as well. Also turning on experiments in developer tools is also a very cool thing to see what's coming next. Because uh, a, a few features uh, we try out, but we have to get through the whole pipeline to get it up into the other Chromium browsers. And sometimes we just try things out. And I just wrote a huge blog post about this, how we actually, we, we take experimental features and we want them immediately. So we, so we write some, uh, some abstraction library to give them to us immediately. And then these features change because they're actually an experiment and they haven't been standardized yet. So a lot of the landfill of the web is basically because we wanted features before they were ready. Uh -huh. When you talk about Bootstrap, for example, a lot of the fixes in Bootstrap that are still there, like a lot of CSS code that comes with Bootstrap automatically is for Internet Explorer 8 and 9 and 7. And they're actually not applicable any longer. They shouldn't be in there any longer. But because we wanted to have an abstraction that works everywhere, we create mm -hmm. a lot of code that's 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 going from there. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, this is. I think we covered things pretty well with this. Um, I, I've. Um, I'll paste the link in the chat again for that. That um, AKMS link. And uh, I. I played with this this morning. It's, it was super quick install and really easy to use. So, um, uh, yeah, I can't think anything else to say. That's that good stuff. Anything else I had from you? No, that that's really about it. You know, um, yeah, I would just try to encourage everybody to try this out and and uh, to leave us some sort of feedback. <clears throat> you know, whether that's hey, I liked it, it was great, or you know, hey, this doesn't work for me. And and honestly, I'm looking for more of the kind of latter, right? I mean. I want to find the issues, right? I'm, I'm happy to hear that it's working, uh, but the more valuable is the scenarios that it's not working, you know, so that way we can kind of fix things for everybody there and then go from there. But, uh, you know, I think this is really just the kind of beginning um, of edge developer tools inside uh, Visual Studio here. So, yeah, I mean, you know, they're, we're going to kind of keep going from here. This is, this is not the end. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a per perfect place to wrap up then, huh? I think yeah, Science junior, junior Developer is actually wanting a meeting here, yeah? Yeah, there you go, there you little, go. Little, little Syed is ready for, for hanging out, I guess, you know? Awesome. Okay, well, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, thanks, Syed and Chris, for your time. And uh, and uh, this is, I'm, I'm going to be off to play with it more right after this. So <laughs> thanks so much. Thank okay. you. Stay safe, bye -bye. be nice to each other, and see you soon. Yeah.